So I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee for May 12th. Um, uh, Bill? Here. Dan? Yeah, here. Mark? Here. And Laura, I'm here. And um, who is going to be our note taker today? We're going to record. It is being recorded, it is being recorded but... Um, <laughs> Who did it last time? I think Nick might have done Nick it last, did it last time. time. Nick did it last time. I did it before that. Okay. Um, so have, you have you done it? I haven't done it, but I don't really <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, recording. You can go back. Yeah. Recording. That's what I did. All right. Would you be willing to do that, Dan? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll the recording. No, um, I don't believe we have any um, minutes to approved this time. No, they might have been sent to me. I'm still working my way through my emails. Yeah. <laughs> this is recording. Yes, this is so. being recorded. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, no no minutes to approve for today. Um, the next item on our agenda is chair's report. I'm going to keep this super brief. Uh, Aaron and I presented to the Public Works Commission on April 12th. A recording of that meeting is available on YouTube on the Minuteman Media Network. Um, uh, basically, we were here to brief them on the issues that we're working on to tell them about the comprehensive transportation and mobility plan and, and what that's going to entail. Uh, we had a brief discussion sort of teasing out the differences between this committee's work and um, the Traffic Safety Commission's work and sort of, you know, they're the first line of defense for specific safety concerns and we're more of a policy the advisory committee. Um, so that was a, a good discussion. Um, we flagged some areas for potential collaboration with Public Works, which is um, sort of what prompted this meeting and why we wanted to have um, uh, Public Works at this at this meeting. The first was to advocate for greater funding for maintenance and improvements in our transportation infrastructure, including roads, sidewalks, and cycling infrastructure, um, and also to review the winter maintenance plan. Um, uh, you know, in the context of our like multimodal transportation goals. Um, so uh, those were some potential areas of collaboration between us and the Public Works Commission. Um, members of the commission flagged a couple of concerns about siloing. So I just want to pass that along. Um, some of the things that they flagged while we're doing this comprehensive transportation and mobility study, um, the planning board is going to be working on a parking study sort of simultaneously. Um, they're also going to be working on zoning changes related to the MBTA Communities Act. So we want to make sure that we're working in close collaboration with the planning uh, with the planning board on those two things, since those are going to be highly interrelated to whatever we whatever we're working on with um, the transportation and mobility study. And I can just mention there that I'm working on both of those as well. So there will be that crossover. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm heavily involved. Don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, I but I did I did want to flag it for all of us that us maybe attending planning board meetings or having a representative going to some of those planning board meetings um, while those while those items are being discussed might be a good practice for us. Yeah, could uh, could you send out an, another reminder heads up when there are planning board meetings that have oh, any of these things list. any of these things on the agenda? Yeah, because uh, I, I as as I'm able I would like to to watch. Uh, and the planning board, because of those, um, the um, uh, rezoning articles, the rezoning article that wasn't moved, some of the people from the planning board actually said we need more early involvement to to watch things. And the MBTA thing is a little bit confusing in terms of um, what it's asking for, what the goal is, and what if anything could be done, whatever what it would change in Concord. There are a lot of things that wouldn't change because. Yeah, it. I mean, in a lot of ways, it it's won't change anything immediately. It's right. zoning, which is more of a um, what could happen as opposed right. to a promise as to what will happen. Right. If that's if that and, makes and sense. And those things and these some of these zoning things in and and whatever might happen interacts with parking and with traffic and mm -hmm. all the stuff. Yeah, I'm sure that this will come up on future agendas for us. Um, but just wanted to mostly flag that. The other thing to flag for everyone is that um, I have heard from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail Committee that um, uh, the, the final layer of pavement just went on to the bridge over Route 2 on the 9th, um, and it's going to be officially open to the public at the end of this month as opposed to the end of 
June or July, which is what we thought it was going to be. Um, and so the possible opening ceremony, which you know we would all be invited to participate in, would potentially be on Friday, um, June thirtieth. Um, and there will be um, you know legislators there and folks from DOT and um, all sorts of things. So that um, that's something to have on your calendar. And if anybody's interested in helping to plan that, um, let me know. Um, and I can put you in touch with um, the, the group that's planning that. So that's it for my report. Um, the next item on our agenda is winter maintenance. And Aaron, who I believe is online. Oh, oh no, you're here. here. You're both. He's, um, he's strong uh, Aaron's going to give us an <laughs> overview. And just to sort of give give the context for this discussion, we started sort of a uh, we started a discussion about winter maintenance earlier in the year. We were kind of this was when there was still snow on the ground, looking at um, the multimodal aspects of of our transportation system how how was snow removal and ice um you know interacting with our with our pedestrian and cycling infrastructure um so what as i recall that conversation we determined that we needed to get some more information about how decisions were being made how much things cost um, when it comes to snow removal so that if you know there were requests for changes in the in which things were plowed or which order things were plowed that we had all the information. So um, Aaron, thanks for being here to Absolutely. give us the yeah. overview. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna give a little PowerPoint presentation. Um, but for the record, my name is Aaron McClosco. I'm the Highway and Ground Superintendent of the Town of Concord. You have privileges? Let's see if I go here. So. I don't have host. <laughs> yeah, I can share. Okay, great. <laughs> In fact, uh, Aaron, can you expand that screen? You know, just the view. There you go. Right. Maybe you want to have that open just so we can see if somebody's got a hand raised. Or... I can see that on my screen. Too. Oh, okay. Good. Yep. Um, so, uh, Aaron from across Ohio Highway Ground Superintendent um, down at Concord. Uh, this presentation is, is an annual presentation that I give to the Public Works Commission. Just so everyone knows, I've, I have updated our information um, since it's been a whole winter season since the, the November presentation that I provided um, the commission. Um, but our winter maintenance program, Concord Public Works and Public Works Commission policy is to maintain a level of service that keeps Concord street systems, which include sidewalks and parking lots, passable and safe for pedestrian and vehicular traffic especially for emergency vehicles such as police, fire, and ambulance, or any other vital service as much of the time as possible within the limitations imposed by extremes of nature and resources available. And what that means is you know, um, every storm is different, right? The timing, uh, the intensity, um, our resources can fluctuate depending on um, the things that we've seen that are sometimes outside of our control, like COVID, for example, a couple of years ago, really put a, a, a damper on it. But we do uh, approach every storm a little bit differently in our technique with the same general uh, mission of what's stated up here and to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, our priorities are public safety, employee safety, uh, efficiency, you know, fiscal responsibility, and sustainability. And I'll talk uh, to each of those as we go on. But areas that we maintain as part of our winter maintenance program include over 100 miles of public roadways, uh, four miles of private roadways, 44 miles of sidewalks, and 12 parking lots throughout the community. So last season, um, you hear people say, we had a light winter. Uh, I tend to disagree. Uh, you know, every winter is, every winter, is still a huge impact on the department. A lot of what we do, uh, we do regardless of how much snow uh, and ice uh, accumulate or how bad the winter is. A lot of our work is done in advance. There's a ton of preparation that go into it, but it's just some of the highlights from this first or this last season. Our first uh, winter operation was November 5th, uh, 15th. It was about, about an inch of snow. Um, one inch resulted in nine and a half hours of operation. We did de-icing applied to, of over uh, 98 tons of sun, uh, uh, road salt um to de-ice and it was a partial activation of um our crew we didn't bring in any contractors and that one inch of snow cost the town over twelve thousand five hundred dollars our largest accumulation event um for this season which is well under um years past um, but there were two events um, both had about four and a half inches of snow first one was on january 22nd 
it was a 29 hour operation. Um, a lot of de-icing in that situation, 308 tons of salt plowed. We also did a full plowing operation and it was a full deployment of all of our CPW staff and contractors at just over $51,000 for that one event. Um, and our last event uh, was March 13th, uh, about four and a half inches of snow. So again, tied uh, for the largest event. That one was only 17 and a half hours, de-icing operation, 338 tons of salt, full plowing operation with our contractors and um, um, our full staff, $85,000 for that event as well. So uh, in summary, 18 total events that we had um, staff and above, and um, more than just supervisors coming in, uh, responding to the to the town. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, and I'll get into kind of how we monitor the town, but we'll often have one person kind of coming in where it's a questionable event. Are we going to get accumulation? Are we not? Is it going to ice up? Is it not? We have uh, a manager come into town and kind of inspect the roadways. Uh, but we had 18 operations where we called in staff to respond. Um, we did not do any post-storm removal operations. So in years past, we've had accumulations of you know over a foot, foot and a half, two feet in downtown and in, in the kind of downtown area, the Thoreau Depot, West Concord areas. We'll follow up after the storm and do an overnight cleanup, basically remove all the snow that's along the meter line of the windrow. Um, so that it's uh, more pedestrian friendly. People can get out of their motor vehicles instead of having to step over a snowbank, they can just cross right over. Um, but there was not any accumulations that resulted in, in extended periods where there was that row of snow that we had to um, I'm going to do that this year. In years past, it's usually one or two, um, and that's always dependent on uh, kind of time and year and, and some other factors that I'll get into. Total accumulations, very low this uh, for total, but 27 inches of, of, of snow. Staff hours, 4,649 staff hours uh, um, for just winter operations alone. Contracted hours, um, so we'll hire contractors and they bring in a piece of equipment, whether it's a truck or a heavy equipment like a loader or a backhoe, and and may spend 631 hours um, here in town. Roadway application, uh, 4,566 tons of salt were applied to the roads for de-icing and total expense this year um, was pretty low. It was just over half a million dollars under budget. What is budgeted? Uh, $600,000. But snow and ice is the one, I would say the 600, it, that's, that's, that's consistent. Um, snow and ice is one fund that uh, can be deficit spend. And in most, in all communities, Massachusetts, it's deficit spend. Some communities budget, you know, uh, a fraction of what they use annually. Um, Mass General Law allows municipalities to deficit spend that because you never know how bad your winter is. It's not, you know, we hit 600,000. I'm not plowing roads anymore, right? You still have to maintain. <laughs> that, is one, that, is one, that is one unique uh, fund that can be deficit spent. And then um, basically what happens at town meeting, uh, there would be an article to um, allocate funding to make that account whole at the end of the year. And, and just as a follow-up, if you have a, a surplus, does that roll over into the following year? No, it does not. It's part of the general fund and then becomes free cash and goes back into uh, general. So our overview, what we do, uh, a lot of a planning. Um, I, I'm not, these are the topics that I'm going to hit as this presentation goes along, but planning, talk about our operations, management, fleet maintenance, and uh, different techniques we use. So our planning, our planning starts in summer. So our budget, you know, that the the, the uh, town people just approved at town meeting a couple weeks ago, uh, it becomes effective July 1st. And that's when we start planning and, and procuring items. So we procure contracted services. So we will hire contractors that bring in um, a piece of equipment, whether it's a truck uh, or a, um, a load or a backhoe. And we have a set rate depending on the type of apparatus that they bring to town and they maintain their vehicles, they supply their own fuel, and they basically they plow until we tell them to, to go home. Um, and we are looking at um, uh, also vehicles, you know, we purchase vehicles annually. Um, the roads are plowed with heavy trucks and equipment. And so we have to, as soon as the funding is available, we start ordering our vehicles. Now, those are vehicles that typically aren't available for that winter season. It usually is now taking over a year to get a vehicle once we order. We have vehicles we ordered two years ago that are still not arrived. Um, so that's something that we are trying to be very proactive on and use and get as creative as we can to get getting out of vehicles in there. are different vendors that are out there. We order all our vehicles off the state contract. So it's you know the best price available for the town. But right now, we are seeing extreme delays with getting vehicles in. Aaron, can I just interrupt just? On the contract services, it's gotten very competitive. 
is very challenging. And so we are looking at a market where other communities are also looking at this additional support service. And you, you think about it, you can only staff so much in house. And for those larger events, you need the external support, but the other communities are equally you know, in a similar situation. So you're jockeying to try and, right. you know, sort of, we, we have to stay competitive with the pricing. Otherwise, yeah. you know, a contractor will go to another community. You know, <clears> if we <throat> don't call them in and they, you know, just like we make a commitment, our employees make a commitment, you know, there's mandatory overtime, there's forced call-ins for staff to come in. Um, they have to report to work when we call them in. Um, when contractors, <laughs> you know, they make a commitment, uh, I call them and they don't come in, I won't, call, you know, we don't call them back. Um, but they're also making a commitment to, we're also making a commitment to them to say, hey, you know, when there's storms, you're going to be available and we're going to call you into work. Um, yeah, obviously, there's a premium rate. It's a higher rate, but they are all not just supplying that person. They're supplying the equipment, which costs a lot of money to maintain. So um, we have a good relationship with a lot of the contractors that we have. We have some larger uh, local uh, construction companies that we work with. Uh, they've been working with the town for years, and um, they're very. Uh, we have a good relationship, and they're very reliable. So every year, we also look at supplies. So road salt, we were all our salt up the state contract. Um, a plow blades is a consumable uh, wear part on our vehicles. And then also, you know, vehicle equipment and parts, um, just like anything else, things break, things, you know, these vehicles are out there in the worst conditions possible on doing some very hard work. And there's a lot of wear and tear on our trucks and equipment. And so we make sure we have uh, parts on the shelf because, uh, you know, Acton Ford and Nap Auto Parts are not open at two o'clock in the morning when something breaks. You can't have that truck down all weekend. And we, we have stuff that's on the shelf so we can, we can get it repaired and back out of the road. Do route route? storage issues too yes uh we are very limited with our storage if you've been to this facility we have all of our truck most of our trucks are parked outside uh that is not typical in 2023 public works operations we are probably one of the only communities of our comparable size uh and uh and you know what concord would compare themselves to other communities that parks all these trucks outside there's a lot of wear and tear from uh from being out there in the sun and the weather these trucks are weathered and they will don't get as uh, as much longevity out of them by them being stored outside. You know, we have millions of dollars with a fleet. And it's all outside, and you go to some of our surrounding communities. It's all parked inside, which extends the life, um, and you know, results in less maintenance. So, um, and then our salt shed um, is it's in need of some rehabilitation as well. Um, and so, there's you know, the site is really, um, I say it's kind of outdated, but it is definitely outdated. Uh, yes. So, are the vehicles? Um, parked in this facility or somewhere else as well? All of our vehicles are parked here. Um, our plows and our, so our seasonal um, components that we add to the vehicles, like the plows and the salt spreaders, we don't have enough room to store all of our equipment here. So a lot of it is shifted throughout town seasonally. So off season, right now, all of our plows and all of our senders are at the 755 Walden Street, the compost site. If you've ever gone to the compost site, yeah. the dirt road that goes to the far southeast corner of that, all of our equipment is stored up there. It takes about a week for our crew to get all that equipment from this site, to that site, and then bring it back again in the fall. Are they in the shed or are they open? It's again, all outside. Okay. Has, it, has a study been made in terms of what the cost to build a facility versus the yeah, well, that's a, maintenance? That's a whole other sort of, yes, it's on the radar. The town did a facility assessment probably three or four years ago of the needs of all of the, um, facilities. Um, public works was identified as a priority. Um, challenges is just the shuffling of the budgets. And I think at this point, we have some funds to do a feasibility assessment. And so we'll be looking at, you know, this campus, um, what can be done here? Are there any other sites that we could sort of need to consider? But it's on our radar. Regrettably, it's not going to be something that happens next year but it is on the town sort of capital plan. Hmm. It, it okay. seems to me it's something, you know, because it, it, there could be a long-term cost benefit that uh, something needs some public awareness. So on the, in terms of the, um, the stuff stored um, over by the uh, compost, oh, whatever, that includes some hydraulics and things for the plows or not, or it's just steel <laughs> it's steel they have there's hoses and fittings but there's no yeah. hydraulic reservoirs okay. or no materials like that stored over there in bulk or anything like that yeah um so other things that we look at 
is part of planning process, we're looking at a route optimization. So we have 18 plot routes, we have three sidewalk routes, and we have what we call a hand route, which is essentially another sidewalk route where we um, uh, we look at all those every year. Routes change, construction happens, people put things in the right of way that shouldn't be there. Um, there's modifications. So we send, we do a route optimization. Uh, we send employees out and look, check their routes. We will go check on them. Uh, check them every year and then we'll adjust them for efficiency and then mark out things that we need to we need to check on um, the employee vehicles uh, and assignments uh, so we kind of reassign people we have some newer employees and we shuffle some folks around as needed uh, people retire and we have to reassign their route for example um, and that could be you know like I talked about uh, changes out there on the roadway um, that we need to be aware of the changes kind of how we uh, maintain those those facilities I think of it is when you do your own snow management your property you develop a system and you know how it works it takes a couple seasons to get it right and if you have someone come take care of your driveway they have to take a couple seasons to figure it out so our operators have miles of road and right away that they get really familiar with and that's why this sort of sizing out and scoping out any changes, differences, or new operators getting familiar is, is quite an effort. We also coordinate with other departments. Uh, we're not the only ones out there on the winter time. The CMLP, uh, we just don't have enough staff to operate. Uh, so we work closely with some CMLP. It's got a, they do similar type of work uh, related to construction. Their operators have similar skills and the licenses that are required to operate our equipment. So some of the staff from, from that department come over. Uh, we work closely with facilities department to coordinate kind of building, opening, and parking lot schedules um, so that those facilities can be open. Public safety, police and fire, obviously working very close with them throughout the storm so that we can make sure that their routes are clear to get to emergencies uh, as they need to respond. And then the school department as well um, to make sure that, you know, sidewalks are open ahead of school times. Um, and if there's any delays or um, any early releases, we're able to coordinate with them. Um, also working with you know, their transportation group on on buses and making sure the buses can get through town as well as we have you know changes in elevation and that can complicate um things for for buses if they need to you know travel during the day when you know the height of a storm for example do a lot of employee training so um you know we have uh training courses we can send to our, our employees to um related to winter maintenance that kind of educate them on on best practices throughout the commonwealth and then we host our own uh, operations team meeting every season where we meet with all of the staff in public works to participate in this program and kind of set the expectations, assign routes, talk about vehicles, address any issues, uh, et cetera. So just a few photos of the things that I just referenced. The, the photo on the top left is our salt shed that's located here in the southeast corner of this facility. You can see some salt deliveries that have just arrived and we use a, a front loader uh, um, to move those salt piles um, from the uh the outside and into that salt shed uh bottom left is a, a salt spreader being loaded into a truck with a loader and then uh boat on the right same thing it's kind of a, one of the smaller spreaders and getting loaded into that back of that f-550 dump truck another thing that we're very aware of and interested in we are in a floodplain on this campus mm -hmm. and so that's one of the challenges of kind of seasonal management where in the winter we'll have that surplus supply available and stored outside you know we're not concerned about flooding um, as much uh, but come summer uh, spring that has to be you know tightened up managed and in the event there was floods and it's happened uh we'd have to relocate that material <laughs> yeah. so yeah but these are the things that we sort of juggle that's all just mm -hmm. to be aware of does that shed hold the entire town's supply of salt yes or like the storm two storms maybe we're constantly filling that yeah so there's yeah. continual deliveries and you know that's another sort of you know management through the season through the winter and you want to have it available um but at the same time come summer you don't want excess so it's just it's it's yeah. part of that so we hold so we have the shed we stock the shed up at the beginning of the season we also have large piles just outside of the shed under large tarps and that is our break the glass as we refer to it because what happens is if we have an extended storm we we work storms that are 50 hours in duration every season usually this is this this season was atypical where we have like 29 hours so those long storms where we're constantly having a de-ice we will empty that shed in that storm and then we're in a situation where we're calling uh chelsea um is where they offload all the salt from the container ships and asking them for salt well so is it's 364 right. communities right <laughs> well, asking the same facility they can only get so many trucks loaded at a time for assault. 
So we have an extra pile. So if we get in that situation, we can pull that tarp and start loading trucks with our with our backup supply. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, only a handful of seasons where we get into that situation. It's usually like mixed precipitation where it goes from snow back to ice, mm -hmm. back to rain, back to snow, and it just kind of our you know the salt will end up getting washed away. Our typical plowing process, uh, you know, we pre-treat it. So I don't get to it. We pre-treat, we plow, and then we'll treat at the end. But you get the mist precipitation where temperature fluctuates and you keep getting refreezing of the roads. The only way you can't plow ice off of a road, you have to de-ice it to make it safe. So the only way to do that is to to apply some road salt. So um, yeah, we fill the shed throughout the season. We're getting deliveries constantly. So operations, uh, it's kind of this are team briefings held in this room. About Excuse me, Aaron, I'm going to say where you can be brief, be brief. Right. I'm just looking at the clock, and I know we got to be out of here by 11. Mm -hmm. So just just throw that out there. So certain things I know this group wants to talk about, too. So, so it's our staffing plan. You can kind of see it here. We, we meet with everybody. You know, we have the different routes throughout town. We do some private roads. The reason uh, the private roads for this group, in case the question comes up, there's a town meeting vote back in 1964 that also authorized the town to spend general fund um, on uh, monies on uh, private roads for de-icing operations only. We don't patching; it's just for winter maintenance. They have to meet specific criteria, kind of listed there. It has to be the big ones are pre-1955 layout in a home every 500 feet. It's got to be safe for the plow. So we have a list of those roads. Any new developments don't obviously qualify because they're not pre-1955 layout. Sidewalks and business districts and school areas. I'm going to show everybody the routes that we maintain, so everyone get a visual on the on the sidewalks that we that we plow, and then uh, parking lots are out on there publicly owned, and we have 13 de icing routes throughout town. Uh, operations plan. So we continuously monitor the forecast uh, all season. We're watching uh, watching the weather all day, kind of all night. We do have this uh, new software where we are able to uh, use roadway weather information systems. It's the third season, we're able to remotely monitor roads. Uh, we do pre-storm assessments um, and kind of develop our strategy. You know, we are constantly communicating with our employees, posting the you know the weather forecast, and depending on, like I said, the timing of the storm, what's what's forecasted, our approach is going to kind of going to kind of change throughout storm. And then during the storm, we operate a snow desk where we staff it um, with a supervisor, dispatcher, and you know, constantly watching the weather and adjusting as needed. Doing townwide inspections, so we are walk, we're looking at the the road temps, the road conditions. We're out there driving the roads and doing physical inspections um um we're kind of allocating kind of resources tracking our equipment we have breakdowns shifting people around shifting routes and then accountability obviously we're out there in some, uh, some um awful conditions and we want to make sure everybody's safe uh so we're constantly doing kind of uh accountability checks and we're working and looking at uh communications um like i said we have radios uh, cell phones um monitoring public safety radios to see where they're at and what they need from us um, and then we have a snow desk where we have a phone system. Uh, you know, if anybody calls during any storm, uh, if anybody calls the public works office during any storm, you're going to talk to a person. So if you have a concern, an issue, complaint, um, want to know where to drop off the donuts, uh, <laughs> they can talk to a real person and we can give that information. Um, like if there's a complaint, you know, we took on a mailbox or somebody's driveway, you know, got buried with snow. Uh, a supervisor will respond and meet with the resident um, and go and inspect that area. So uh, we provide that service. Most communities do not provide that level. Yeah, you know, on the service. allocation of resources, that's where it is dynamic depending on the storm. Right. And that really is something which is almost real-time reaction to you know, sort of events. And uh, examples are we may be in an area, we may have our crews plow, there might be some sidewalk work done, a private contractor then comes along and changes it. And we, you know, are now getting a call. Mm -hmm. We're now, you know, well, this is an emergency in this particular street or intersection, and it's just forever. There's a back and forth of that snow desk. Is there's constant conversation and communication, and generally they're not called saying thank you. So there's a lot of activity. <laughs> Demand. Demand. <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of needs yeah. uh, and a lot of interaction with the community during these storms. Where do you find the number for the snow desk? It's so it's the highway and grounds phone number. Okay. So it's posted on and it's posted on the town website. So if anybody goes to public works website, uh highway and grounds, um 978-318-3220. And so that rings in multiple locations. Uh these are some photos, <clears throat> self-explanatory kind of uh so this is our sidewalk plow. We also have a skid steer in the top left, clearing a bridge deck. 
um, loading a truck with um, with salt. And then, you know, during storms, other things happen that we need to respond to. As trees come down, now we have to pull plow operators off in a row, give them a chainsaw, give them all the PPE they need, and then send them out to go, you know, cut the trees so we can continue oh, doing our work and then also open it up for, for public to, to travel our fleet. Uh, 28 plow vehicles and equipment, varying, you know, varying types. The top right photo has some of our um, international heavy duty dump trucks with a front plow and a wing plow and a dump body on them. We have some uh, loaders, backhoes that we use, a number of salt spreaders. All of our salt spreaders have ground speed controllers. And what that is, instead of, you know, an operator, when they come to a red light, remembering they have to turn the sprinkler <laughs> off, it shuts it off. The faster they drive, the faster it, it spins. Mm -hmm. And basically we have preset. Um, so all of our, all of our equipment, essentially it's computerized, right? So it's programmed our standard treatment. We follow mass DOT 250 pounds per lane mile, but we can adjust that down or up mm -hmm. as needed, depending on the conditions. And so all of our equipment is calibrated and inspected seasonally and throughout the season. If there's any issues that we, you know, come up, I could be driving behind a truck. It looks like it's not operating correctly, not putting on enough salt, putting out too much salt. We'll let the operator know, we'll go back to the shop while the mechanic look at it. So that, that, that work is being done throughout the season. Um, Cleaning and equipment is a huge thing. Salt is very corrosive. Uh, so after every storm, we are washing all the trucks. We're washing all the salt off and getting them clean. We do not let them sit there all season and just throw it away. Um, constantly doing inspections and circle checks of the trucks. Um, and we have full-time mechanics on duty throughout the season. Photos of some of our trucks here. Um, bottom left of the salt spreaders. We do liquid brine application. That's the bottom middle photo. It's a smaller brine tank spraying a, a liquid um, brine, a salt brine solution on the roadway. Uh, bottom right is a sidewalk plow with a snowblower on the front of it. Top left, F550 with a nine foot uh, Fisher HC plow. And that brine spreader is, is really important. We, we're always balancing the public safety uh, against the environmental impacts, too. Sure. And so, you know, we, we're, we're mindful of, you know, the salt impacts on the environment. Same time, we got the acute safety risks that we're trying to manage, too. So, um, it's smart, and it's also a way of sort of preserving, you know, and reducing costs if we apply, you know, uh, with consideration to, you know, not overdosing. So um, we had, like, we implemented a few years back this road weather information system. So we partnered with this year with a company, New Robotics, that provide us some real-time data on, on weather conditions and also roadway conditions. So it gives us an air temp, a road temp, air, um, dew point and humidity. Uh, provided live imagery, um, and uh, we're able to monitor remotely. So I can see in town, we have these seven locations throughout town from my cell phone. It could be at home, it could be here, it could be, you know, anywhere, and be able to see what are the conditions of the road. So not only, you know, relying on temperatures, but what's actually happening out there um, on the roads. Road temp is a huge thing because, you know, you've got precipitation on the road. It's 33 degrees. It's safe to travel with no uh, treatment. It drops to 32 and now it's a sheet of ice. And now we have to, you know, in a lot of these storms where it comes down to half a degree we're, and we're out there, um, you know, because the news says it's one temperature, that's not where it is everywhere, right? Our temperatures fluctuate throughout town. That's why we have seven different devices. Um, we have a large town, varying elevations, and it could be snowing in Nurse Neck Hill and it's raining down here in Concord Center. Um, so this allows us to better um, uh, better monitor those roads. And then, you know, I don't have to go out and treat the whole town. I might only have to treat part of the town. That reduces our environmental impacts and it also reduces costs. Um, so it works well. So it's, about where in town are those devices? Uh, uh, so deployed? we have one at Nurse Neck Hill or Whitsun. There is one here at the Public Works Yard. There's one at um, um, Virginia Road out just before... Um, just before the airport on the Virginia Road near Hanscom. There's one on Main Street at 220, uh, 2224 Main Street. So it's the uh, Superfund site. Um, there is one, uh, uh, Lowell Road at Hartwell. And is that seven? I can't Good think for seven. future. Yeah, I, I think we yeah, want to probably give you a map of where they are. put that well. on a map for yeah. future. Yeah. It's worth seeing. Yeah. They're just distributed based on operator experience and knowing you know based with you know police yeah. have been sort of real-time calls coming in so it's optimized and, and the real important thing is you see the the cost for response is tens of thousands of dollars so this technology you know every hour you can save pays for itself mm -hmm. and um it's really kind of useful new technology that aaron's been sort of a you know kind of a, a lead on but it also you know has as, as the the value of just um, knowing 
and we're optimize it as we go. I mean, the cost of this equipment's going down a little bit. Some some equipment on the vehicles you're yeah, using. So yeah, the um, yeah uh, the last location it's uh, Fitchburg Turnpike, so Route 17 at Sudbury Road. Um, but yeah, and then we also have some some units that are uh, just local units on vehicles. So as somebody drives around, you know, there's a readout on their dash that they can see kind of road temp and air temp. Yeah. So, and, so. Uh, on the stationary seven locations, is that actually logged? Because that would be interesting to some people who were doing studies of. of they are logged. Yeah. And so, we like have, so we have. You know what I mean? Yeah, so we have. Yeah. So that little screen. Yeah. The little screenshot on the bottom is basically what it is. You get a photo. Um, all that data, they also provide us tr trends. They have their uh, uh, algorithm that they use. Huh? Can you zoom in on that? Uh, no, no, without okay. dropping it. Down. There might yeah, be some civil engineering schools that would be interested yeah. to look at. There's kind of a lot of, there's know. a lot, we use a lot of different technology. Um, we also partner with a couple different for forecasting companies that allow us to um, provide some real-time data. And there's some things that are, you know, they're collecting data from vehicles and all these it's pretty cool technology out there. Um, treatment and plowing. So we talked, we talked about that. So, uh, essentially we're pre-treating before storms, um, plowing throughout this, out the storm and then treating at the, at the end is, is our typical, um, you know, high level operation. Um, we do talk, Alan talked about kind of the road, brine, road brine that we're using, or excuse me, the, the liquid brine that we're using on the roads. Um, that's used only in specific situations. So you can't have uh, a mixed precipitation event that starts with rain. And then it goes to snow because the rain will wash away the brine. So we have to have a pretty solid forecast that it's going to be dry and freezing temperatures ahead of the snow accumulation. And then we can brine. It takes days for us to brine the town. We can't just do it a couple hours. It, it takes two full days for us to get most of the main roads throughout town. Um, just because we only have one large truck and one small truck that can do the work. And they have to drive every single road and come back here, fill up, get back out on the roadway. Um, we do use treated salts. So we'll mix salt with magnesium chloride uh, to make it have a lower freezing point. So when temperatures go below 25 degrees, regular salt becomes less effective. And then we'll mix the salt um, with uh, with the mag chloride. It makes it more effective at those lower temperatures. Plowing operations. We'll go. To, we'll start plowing once we get about two inches of snow to be able to accumulate anything less than that. Um, we're we're treating the roadways. Um, sidewalk plowing start at the same time roadway plowing is and like I said we have three of those routes and it continues until the storm ends um, and then we'll do additional road widening and, cl and clearing of uh, um, crosswalks and curb ramps and all that stuff at the end of the storm because the operators are in the truck for the 24 hour storm uh, I don't have additional staff to do that separately and and really if you do it early it just gets buried again by the snow plow it's you know you're constantly competing on, on clearing the snow um, so all that stuff is done at the end of the storm um, and then we'll do, we do snow removal from parking lots. We don't just plow the snow. We have loaders loading dump trucks and hauling that snow to one of our two snow dumps. Um, those snow dumps are located uh, at Walden Street, the compost site. So when we're not making compost in the wintertime, we're using it for a snow dump. And then in, uh, we have a proper use agreement with MCI um, in Concord and off behind their facility in ComAB. We dump snow there as well. Um, I talked about earlier about the business district downtown post storm snow removal average cost is about $15,000 for just to do that one night operation to remove all the snow. Um, and it really depends on, you know, how much snow is accumulated out there, what our future forecast looks like. If it's going to be 40 degrees for three days afterwards and it's all going to melt, we're probably not going to spend the $15,000 to do that. Um, but if it's going to, you know, be frozen temperatures for extended period of time, we're, we're going to do it. We also look at the time of the year. Um, we have a lot of businesses downtown that rely on kind of the holiday, you know, commerce and people coming out shopping. So if it's, you know, any time before the holidays, we're definitely going to get out there and, and, and remove that snow. Um, and then it could be, you know, it could be at the end of March. We you know it's going to be warm temperatures in the next day and it's not going to, we're not going to do it. Um, snow piles are removed from sidewalks and roadway areas uh, where needed, um, you know, following a large event. And then um, working with, you know, water department and fire to clear hydrants, um, also active storms. Just some photos from some of our operations. Top right, I will note the top right in the top middle. Uh, that's that's Doug White. Um, actually, that's the, the Memorial Stadium up at the high school. So we work with the the school department um, to plow athletic fields as needed. This was huge during COVID when the athletic seasons got shifted, and they did some fall sports in the winter. Um, so we have some specialty equipment that we can go and safely plow the the, the artificial turf fields uh, without damaging them. Um, to allow those to be you know, used uh, throughout the season by uh, by athletic uh, groups. Um, and downtown top left is downtown snow clearing uh, before and kind of after the bottom photo and then during uh, the bottom middle.
And that's it for that presentation. But I will show, I know that the folks are very interested in the sidewalk plowing. Um, so these are our, our routes uh, for sidewalk plowing. Um, so we have three routes. I'll start with route one. So the red indicates uh, a regular sidewalk. So when I say regular, it's either concrete or asphalt. The green are stone dust sidewalks. Um, the, the, the unique thing about the stone dust sidewalks is if the ground is not frozen, we cannot plow them. Uh, we will, the, the, our equipment's heavy and uh, a plow will just rip up all the stone dust and cause a lot of damage and ruts and potentially a safety issue. We also create a maintenance issue post storm as well. Uh, so if the ground is not frozen, we will not plow them. We will do our best to clear as much snow from them as possible using different techniques. And then we'll have to really either salt the ice and snow away post storm and that takes a while. Uh, so that does generate some complaints. I get complaints both ways. I get complaints that we plow them and I get complaints that we don't plow them. So uh, we just do our best to make them as passable uh, as possible throughout the winter season. Um, <clears throat> the next one is Route 2. Uh, again, red is the, the regular um, hard pack. And then there's some green in there that have um, some stone dust. Um, and some of the and, things that drive these routes, Aaron, were uh, so uh, huge things are um, we have so we have a sidewalk plowing policy. It's on the town website. It's established by the Public Works Commission, um, and the sidewalks they need to be wide enough for us to use our equipment. We need almost five feet of clearance. Uh, we need five feet of clearance to get our equipment. It's literally it's just five feet wide at the <laughs> narrowest point. Um, it has to be within certain distances for schools. Um, and it also had there they are also we focus on the uh, the kind of the downtown business districts so we have uh, the downtown concord the road depot and west concord um, business areas so the and the distances for schools are defined as half a mile for kindergarten one mile for first through sixth graders and one and a half miles for seventh graders and up and each year we uh, do a review of those school walking routes and you know either add or subtract as needed. I have a question for you, Aaron. Um, That's what I said. Ah, so I'm looking at the West Concord Business District. Yep. Okay, so now now it's a little bit better. Yeah, there's okay. three rubs that so yeah. this is the West Concord one. I'll be just moving okay. here. All right, now okay. Thanks. And then we do not we do not plow uh cul-de-sacs or dead ends that are along along those either. Um, that's listed in the policy. And part of the policy has been it's evolved over time because everybody's interested in any access to driveway or uh, sidewalk near them, and it's just resource driven. You know, there's there's finite resources. Um, so presently, as Aaron has sort of provided an overview, the program is very um, deliberate. You know, because of the, the the challenges of costs and resources, and so everything we do, including the addition recently, we added the uh, right. the artificial turf fields, for instance, were you know, something that's going to stretch the resources. And what we have to do is take care of the primary um, needs, and we're dealing with long winters where the operators just are you know working you know, extended hours. And this is our challenge. Once there's a commitment, we hear from those who, you know, are expect have an expectation almost immediately. You know, there's a certain allowance of in the midst of a storm, everybody's hunkered down because they realize there's a storm. As soon as it's over, everybody wants to get out. And when they get out, the expectation is the town's ready for them. And we're not. It, there's a delay. It takes time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the calls that we get are, you know, well, why isn't this done yet? Now we made commitments. And so those routes that we have, we right. will get to. Yeah. So, um, and we've, so the, the, the standard operating procedure, barring any major events or issues with staffing or major equipment failures, are once a storm is finished, we are plowing the roads until they are, you know, you can it's black asphalt from curb to curb, right? We're treating their de iced and they're safe for travel, all the roadways. Sidewalks are all plowed at least once um, and down as much as possible. And if we we don't salt all the sidewalks, that's the biggest thing. So if we were to plow the roads and not treat them at the end, they'd still be covered in the white hard pack, um, which is almost like almost like ice, mm -hmm. right? We don't salt all the sidewalks. 
So when we plow them, we plow all the snow off of them. And even per our policy, we won't plow sidewalks that are less than two inches of snow accumulation because we'll end up doing more damage with those sidewalk plows than we are plowing any snow. Um, so we will plow all the sidewalks. Those will be all plowed. We also then shovel and plow all of the curb ramps at all of the crosswalks. So we have crosswalks throughout town. Uh, we will go and um, we prioritize and start with the ones that are downtown or near schools and shovel all of the crosswalks because um, that's an area where you plow the road, you plow the sidewalk, and I have a windrow of snow. People have to walk over that at the curb ramp, the crosswalk, we'll clear all of that out. Um, and that is completed. All the sidewalks will be plowed and all the snow will be removed from the sidewalks. Um, and all the schools are, you know, uh, we don't, and we don't plow the schools, but access to the school property is, is, is clear. That's the minimum that we'll do. Um, and depending on how long we've been here, staff's been here, um, and, you know, kind of the day of the week and the timing of the storm, um, we'll either finish right there um, and send everybody home. Uh, because they've either been here for an extended period of time and, you know, it's the middle of the night or it's the weekend. Um, then the next opportunity that I have, once I've given folks time to get home, to get some sleep, we'll call, either call them back over the weekend as needed, or if it's the next operational period and scheduled shift, we'll call people back to continue to do any follow-up inspections or de-icing that we need to do. Um, there could be areas where we weren't able to get to because it's a, it's a narrow walkway, like um, maybe Cambridge Turnpike, for example. Um, we have a, a specialty route called the hand route. I really talked about that. So I talk about that. Any set, we have sidewalks in town that have pinch points that are narrower than five feet, where it might be two mm. feet or three feet, and it's shovel work, it's hand work. Mm. Um, Cambridge Turnpike, that long stretch of the new section, there's a, um, a guardrail. There is a pedestrian protector on the backside of the guardrail, and then there's a pedestrian guardrail. And that is too narrow for us to get our sidewalk plows through. We recently purchased a new piece of equipment that's a stand-on snowblower and snowplow that's three feet wide, 36 inches wide, and we're able to get through that now with that. Um, but the operators that are operating that are the same operators that's been driving trucks for the snowstorm. So and I can only push a person so long before it becomes unsafe for them to operate heavy machinery, right? And we didn't uh, have a hand route and we had some contractors. We did have contractors. Yeah. We hired contractors and every and they they've quit because it's 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 very tough work. Um it's long extended hours and it's most people don't have the right equipment to do it. But you we see, they quit? Yeah. But the town the town did invest in the equipment this fall. So we've been doing it. Um we did them this this winter with this new equipment in house. Um bridge decks in town that have sidewalks on Main Street. Um there's a couple of them, Elm Street, there's another one. Those are too narrow. So that's post-storm. So if in case you're walking on the sidewalk, you get to the bridge and why isn't the bridge plowed? It's because the sidewalk plow has to jump off, jump back on the sidewalk further down and we just haven't gotten back to it yet because that staff's doing other work. But it's on our list and it will get done. Uh, this year, we also started to uh, plow um, two walking paths. So uh, pilot program. Pilot yeah. program, definitely pilot program within two parking, uh, two, two parks. So there's walkways within Emerson Park and walkways at Rideout Park. I have to say, I really appreciated the Rideout Park path. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there was a lot of interest. And that was a new path that was just constructed. Right. This is new infrastructure. Right. And then it was so heavily used and it wasn't sort of the primary, it wasn't on the policy. Right. So we worked with the town manager. That was part of that new piece of equipment Correct. to allow us mm -hmm. to say, okay, we got to expand the, the service. How do we do it? And so we were fortunate enough yeah. to get that. But those are those are area, like that's an area like Emerson can write out that if we're doing a storm that would probably not be done in the I'll call it the first operational period right. that'll be done in a subsequent operation shortly after it will be a week later it might be 24 hours after the storm mm -hmm. but it will get done once we have some rest and we're following up but we're also you know once we get in that well the second operational period we're dealing with you know um any damage any you know calls requests um any follow-up items um, could be, in, here's, you know, a prime example, like we talked about, is we have operators that are assigned the routes, trained on the routes, inspecting the routes. But if I have somebody that's out sick or on a scheduled vacation, uh, I have to cover that route with somebody who hasn't done it before. They might not do it the same way that the other operator did it, right? Um, and that could generate calls and complaints. And, you know, hey, you got a new guy on the route. He didn't do this. He usually does this. Why isn't it done? Okay, now I have to send somebody out there. I have to go look at it to make sure. Is the request reasonable? Is it appropriate? Is it within our program? And that takes some time to kind of do that and then and then follow up to make sure it gets done. So there could be a variety of reasons why it takes a little bit of time post storm for those secondary things to get done. But like I said, that list of things I gave you a moment ago of all our primary, you know, commitments, those will get done before we send people home. Um, but things happen. You know, usually it's atypical. It's you know, breakdown. I got somebody uh, multiple people out. 
things like that. It's an extended storm. Um, and we don't operate in shifts. Uh, Western part of the country, they are, have so much snow that they, you know, and have staff and they <laughs> rotate people through here. You get called into work, you were here, and you do not get sent home until the storm is done. And that could be a day, it could be two days, it could be three days, and we're here. So we have bunks. <laughs> uh, so we do get people rest. Um, we're constantly, you know, talking to we're talking to everybody. How are you feeling? What are you doing? Um, you know, do you need rest? Uh, you know, we will pull people back here. We do not have a bunkhouse here. So mm -hmm. people are sleeping on cots, they're sleeping mm -hmm. in the cab of trucks, they are, you know, sleeping in the break room chair. Um, everyone's got their spot. What we'll do when we look at the facilities needs, that's yeah. one of those gaps. Yeah, it is. Bunkhouse. It is, <laughs> yeah. Like a, a number of the new if you were to go to yeah. you know, most new similar size public works facilities, they have bunk rooms that are used for winter yeah. operations just because. We need to give people rest. Uh, it's, you know, what they're doing is very important work, and it takes a lot of skill and attention uh, to be able to complete it safely. So, I'm, I'm, go ahead. So, first of all, I wanted to say this is a really great presentation, very complete, and I think um, if there is a way to not to give you more work, but to redo it in a format so that the public can have access to it in some this way. Is, this has been taped. Recorded. Oh, great. Yeah. So this is an opportunity. In fact, I told Aaron, let's give the full explanation because it really is important for people to understand. And so this is going to be available. And, you know, that's one of the values. Well, awesome. of so I, I'm yeah. so glad you did this because because yeah. that will, you know, that will give us an opportunity to publicize it on our website and exactly. maybe CPW can do it as well as some of the other agencies. So thanks. That's yeah. it. That was terrific. I appreciate, so, I appreciate the opportunity. I will say I give the same presentation every year to the Public Works Commission. Mm -hmm. So the November Public Works Commission meeting is always dedicated to, to winter maintenance. Over is that year. recorded too? It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it'd so, be good to highlight those. Yeah. Things. So I have a quick follow up, and that is um, keeping in mind the you know, the larger CPW budget issue that came up. I think it was a couple town meetings ago. Do you guys have a wish list of either equipment or technology that you would like to have in order to continue to do the work? So every year I submit a uh, a capital budget request um, through uh, working with Alan. Uh, it goes to the town manager. Um, we have a five and 10 year capital replacement plan. Um, so it's it's in the budget book. Mm -hmm. That's essentially our wish list. If that gets funded every year for the next five years as it's submitted, uh, we will meet our uh, kind of replacement goals and strategies. Mm -hmm. If it's not, we fall behind. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to quick, uh, but really appreciate this. And it's great to, for the recording can be given out in terms of something shorter, in terms of setting expectations. It might be good to have. Um, on the time town website, you know, DPW, some kind of FAQ regarding um, winter plowing and storm, you know, de-icing, whatever, in terms of telling people just these kind of simple things about, bef you know, before the storm, based on prediction, this can happen. Then, like you said, there's like a first round and a second round, and it takes, you know, just roughly this takes, you know, some something to kind of help set expectations in, 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 in a very clear way as kind of a really abbreviated form of that. Second thing, um, <clears throat> with regard to capital um, uh, capital requirements and things like that. So, take case in point, the salt shed. Um, you know, that might be the kind of thing that um, those kind of things where you can um, uh, decide whether to let the public in a little bit more to the to the downsides. Like, um, you know, suppose you can't get the salt out and it floods and it goes into the rivers. Um, uh, and also the upsides like possible future uh, uh, forward looking cost savings and things like that to, you know, pick pick certain cases to to go to a lower level of, you know, finer level of detail with the public about what some of these capital expenditures Mark, are. I think that's going to be our opportunity and need if we're talking about a future facility. Mm -hmm. This will all be part of the, you know, right. education. Right, yeah, right. Definitely. But there are certain there are certain pieces maybe of the capital budget that are just easier for people to understand. Yeah. And and there are certain risks like, you know, tons of salt going into the river. People would not want that. Um, yeah. And certain upsides that that uh, are not obvious to everybody. Yeah, and it's interesting because the equipment's the capital side. The real constraint is the resources, which are the people and third party consultants. And that's where you know, you can have more equipment, but then there's more personnel and all these sorts of things add on. And it's this, the challenge of the storm is it's just human resource intensive. Mm -hmm. It yes, just requires yes. that's, that's hands on. And that's where that balance of, you know, 
there and said this season, a lot of the activity, well, and, and, and it was easy for most people because they didn't wake up and have to shovel, mm. but all night long, it's this, this sensitivity of temperatures going from oh, yeah. 34 to 28. And this is all happening in the middle of the night. And this is when we're responding. And so you might get up and you're heading off to work and it's all fine. But meanwhile, oh, our so. teams are still been out and about. And so that's where the balance of a, a long winter which is we're lucky. And, you know, um, when I say I get to be, you know, sort of you know, also people do appreciate the effort and you know, we we hear from them as well. You know, in the midst of the storm and we've all been there, you're out there, you're doing your own driveway, you're beat and, you know, you're trying to go on the road. And, you know, it's just everybody's getting a little cranky with these storms, but that just happens everywhere, you know, and for us, it's just yeah, a I, matter of, you know. I would say we don't, we don't, typically we don't get that many complaints. We get a handful. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, some, some, you know, multiple, you know, we hear from the same person throughout the season. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are kind of one-offs. You know, some folks are, you know, you just plow the street while you're plowing. You don't need to plow. Mm -hmm. um, and some are legit yeah, some, where we didn't yeah, know. Yeah. A contractor yeah. comes and changes something and we yeah. go, look, so yeah, this is a problem. And, yeah. and you know, it's good to know. So, yeah, it's, so it's, yeah. it's a handful of stuff. Yeah. It's usually nothing like, you know, like, why is it plowed yet or what's going on? You know, we're, we're very proactive. When you, when you do bring in contractors, do you specify, I mean, is there a minimum amount of time uh, or how do you specify to them when they're done with their job? If, if, I mean, I see, I hear from people, well, the plow is just driving up and down the street with his blade up. Um, is that he's on the clock anyway or, or what? It depends on, I don't know if it's our plow or if it's not our plow. Generally right? not. So, yeah, generally so, so there's a lot of private contractors that don't work for public works that are in town. Um, and the contractors that do work for us are given a specific route and they are teamed up with a full-time employee on that route as well. Mm -hmm. And the two of them are working together to clear their area in town. So somewhere on the sidewalk map that I showed, we have 18 other plow routes uh, for roadways throughout town. Um, we have supervisors. I'm one of them that goes out and inspects the routes. And so when a contractor or an employee comes to us and says, hey, we're done with our route, We'll shoot out there. We'll take a look at the route, make sure it's all squared away. And then once it's done, and they're they're done, and the forecast is showing no more snow, we'll release contractors as soon as we can. Then some of the other thing is the phasing of the storm, where there's you know it's a there's a front, and then it's quiet, but we know it's coming, yeah. so you can't send them yeah. home. And it might be a couple hours, and you know the next front is hitting, and so that's all. It's it's it's. For a unique kind of people who love, you know, Aaron loves this stuff, you know, it really is kind of interesting, <laughs> and it, but it's a art and science. Yes. And, and, and uh, yeah, and I would say the, what the plow down and the plow up, it all depends, right? Because what happens is, you know, we're, con we're constantly communicating on radios. If we are sending folks out to treat the roads with salt, we're not having a plow truck right behind them scraping all the salt off the road. Yeah. So it's strategic when it's our trucks. And, exactly. you know, and a lot of the contractors, I tell them, like, you know, they're not plowing from this yard. Their route might be in West Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a plow drop down, you know, it might be that reduces your speed maybe to 20 miles an hour, where if the plow is up, you can drive 30 miles an hour, right? You can get there a little bit quicker. Um, it's also if a plow is down and they're just scraping asphalt, it's a lot of wear and tear on that, mm -hmm. on that, on that plow blade, too. So mm -hmm. it could be a variety of reasons why they have a plow up. Okay. So I have a couple of questions just in terms of where this work of winter maintenance intersects with, you know, um, route planning for for multimodal transportation, you know, like I'm I'm super curious about how um, the schools are, are plotting their walking routes for the kids and also, you know, what considerations are being made about like people getting to train stations and things like that, just in terms of like, um, we had a presentation from MAPC about like route planning for people who aren't in cars. And so um, it it looks like there's great inter interconnectedness in your plow routes. And I'm curious, like as we're as we're trying to identify projects, are there like pinch points where you're like, oh, if this got corrected, it would make this whole route work so much better or, you know, because we're about to go into this comprehensive transportation mm -hmm. study. So like if if there are Oh, if we if we connected these two sidewalks, then we could do this much more efficient route that would help everybody get to the train station or like that kind of a yeah, thing. For for us, it's not necessarily connecting the sidewalks because our sidewalk routes can our sidewalk plows can jump off a curb and jump off a curb on a, onto a curb pretty quickly. That's that has been it. Our pinch points are really where we and, and what kind of throws it off is mm -hmm. you might have a utility pole in the middle of the sidewalk. We can't have our <laughs> utility pole, right? right? There could be some type of uh, um, a, a transformer that's there or there's 
a large tree that's you know you know wasn't so big and or is planted before there's a sidewalk there or the expectation yeah. that the sidewalks were plowed right we have a lot of old older infrastructure older layouts if you will right in this town um and so that that's usually our biggest obstacle when it comes to that as far as connecting to things like the train station uh there's multiple authorities that right. have jurisdiction <laughs> right so we don't we don't plow so we'll plow if you look at we have a hand route that i didn't show in here but we we plow junction park right so the access and through where kind of the uh the bricks are laid out on the stones we will plow that now they're not with a sidewalk plow but with the hand routes and the newer equipment and shovels and we'll clear that up to the train station but we do not go into the railroad yeah, right away yeah. right Keolis has this contractor that comes in and maintains all that so they do that we do the parking lot we plow the parking lot mbta but we're not up on the sidewalk side of the parking lot that's right? that thorough is that the parking lot on the so that parking lot we, yeah, we do that that's parking lot at the row uh but we don't do the walkway beyond that to the mm -hmm. train station that's a great point we also do parking lots there are how many lots are there? 12 12 that we also maintain throughout the storms mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we've done successfully recently, and it's just coordinating with other departments where we now have Aaron or um, his uh, uh, assistant uh, superintendent will call a coordination meeting for um, town departments in anticipation of a storm. When they start paying attention <laughs> is, you know, 24, 48 hours before most of us do. But so they get an eye on it and then there's coordination as far as town events activities things that we need to know so we'll have a pre-storm coordination meeting with departments could be the library recreation department that sort of thing so they're aware that we are getting ready what if anything special is going on with them what do we need to know and you know it's very effective and this is the value of this the zoom and that sort of thing where it's easy to just say you know aaron will provide a pre-storm um notice a zoom time so people can key in or have a rep from their department key in listen to what the you know he's looking closely at the weather not national but what's going to happen in concord and then they can start getting some sense of all right that's good to know and that's really been helpful for um, office closures or special event activities and that kind of thing so that's new and it's been pretty successful i just have another question about sort of route planning um like for instance the ride out path the reason i've mentioned that is because um uh i actually use that path in order to avoid having to ride with my son on the road there on commonwealth avenue um and so that's what i mean by route planning like if if there are the other the other thing that's come up in conversation is the bruce freeman rail trail since that is a route that a lot of people take to the train now um from the southern what what is it the southern part of of the bruce freeman is a as a walking path for some people so i'm curious like um when you're doing route planning if you have like a cost per mile of plowing, you know, like if we were going to add a sidewalk in order to improve connectivity so that people who might not have a car who live in the affordable housing complex in this one place can get to the train station over here, do we have a sense of like what it will cost the town to plow that on an annual basis so that we can have that in our minds as we're making recommendations for the connectivity for the I think town? that's the next level. I think that's yeah. what we're doing is, the level of effort we have to plan and be strategic is based on existing resources. And what we don't want to do is stretch those resources so the essential things aren't getting done. That's not the question, but that's what we have to say. If there's additional needs, how do we manage it without compromising what we have in place? And I don't think we've had you know, that, that discussion yet. It's kind of what would be an expanded program. What does that look like? Because again, it's just, same storms are are affecting and it's just the duration you can't really take a 12 hour storm which has a maybe a complete um you know 24 hour response say well what if it's a 36 hour response or you know, because it's too late or you know it's that's where instead so the ride out in emerson are the second wave it's kind of like when we're doing the crosswalks too you know you get the first wave and I at yeah, some point there's... one storm is turning to the other so right. well, you know because it's it's you know the staff that we have do a lot of different activities mm -hmm. right and if 
you know, it kind of, we have, for example, we have a work order management system, right? It lists all of our work orders that we get in requests. Mm -hmm. Plus we have all of our routine maintenance that we do. And so post storm, you know, the other things that get added, it's less of that work that's getting done or it delays that other work that you need to do, right? So um, it gets to the point where we only have so much staff and if the program continues to grow, we need to bring in more staff. Well, that's that's more what I'm asking we about. Like, you that, know, map that out. If there's a need, right. if the community says this is what we want, yeah. Yeah. then and we I, need to be able to say, well, this is what would be required to you know meet that new need. Yeah. yeah. So this is sort of a follow-on question. Could could you describe the uh, coordination that you have with the school department with respect to snow removal? Um, and and the context is, you know, I, I'm not clear as, as to who does what at the schools. And, you know, one of the, I think, interests on the part of the school system is to manage their transportation budget. So, you know, as they think about what they're going to do, uh, at least a possibility is to um, encourage kids to walk and bike to school all year, which means potentially, you know, making sure that the various routes to the school and the school are plowed. So how do you work it out with the school? So we do not. So as far as communication and coordination, Alan mentioned the call, you know, pre-storm phone call that we do, you know, they are given that information and, you know, invited to attend if they, mm -hmm. if they so wish. And they usually do attend. Um, we also, you know, talk to them on the phone regularly, the representatives in the facilities department about kind of things that are going on or, you know, what do you see in the storm and et cetera. Um, during the storm, they might call with a request or ask us a question, kind of what we're doing and, you know, what's our timing looking like. Um, we'll also talk, I'll reach out to them, what's their timing on opening or any delays, mm -hmm. things like that, so that we can time up our operation. If they're going to cancel school, I might not prioritize a section. I might be able to give, you know, I might it might change my operational plan that evening or that time frame, right? Shifting resources around. Um, we, so Public Works, does not touch anything on school department property. Mm -hmm. The exception is, um, the part of the access road at CCHS that gets the BD parking lot okay. so that we can plow the BD parking lot because we maintain the BD parking lot. But we do not plow their sidewalks or their, or, or their roadways or their parking lots or any school property in the town. That is done by their facilities department. They have their own trucks and equipment and staff. They call in, they coordinate. They are separate department outside of public works. But the connectivity to the school from we, the residents is part of that policy. Mm -hmm. with yeah. the sidewalk policy right. and so we'll, we'll, we'll do all the sidewalks up to the school department sidewalks and then they take it over from there okay and that's facilities as opposed to transportation transportation so, basically right. the buses transportation is for i'm not yes i'm not i'm not overly involved in their you know their you know uh their structure but mm -hmm. yeah facilities is a separate group like if i were to call uh, their facility supervisor or, or facilities director is different than the transportation director. Right. Two different folks by ambitious. Is there any other town department that you're not responsible for? Like this campus here, do you take care of maintaining these lots? And so, yeah, so we do all town uh, lots, but not. Um, so it, so it, I ask him like building maintenance or as far as like no, parking no, lots? Plowing, parking lots. Um, like White Pond? Yeah. We don't plow White Pond. Like the access road down to the pond, um, that's done by facilities. Um, uh, all uh, we do, Harvey Wheeler, um, on Church Street, pretty much all other non-school departments. Okay. So like NRC parking lots, we do those. Library, library. library. we'll do, yeah. we'll do, yeah. Um, so school departments, the big exception, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, I am mindful of time. We've gone well over on this. That was our 20-minute topic. Minute topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's hard to well, get you know, this. And, and there's, I, a actually, there's a lot to it's it, and, and I actually appreciate you know the opportunity. It said, you know, we do a lot, and a lot of people don't understand what we do, <laughs> and a lot of people don't have the 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 opportunity but the fact that this is recorded is helpful and yeah. you know and your interest is obvious you know there's a there's a need um but you know i do think it's it, it merits the you know the yeah. the full explanation so and aaron thank you for uh yeah thank you that was an extremely yeah. helpful presentation absolutely and, and i think a really important thing for us all to be aware of as we go into this multimodal i mean the mobility and transportation planning yeah, yeah. Very important to know who to call to tell you. you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, to send the donuts next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Everyone the had the conversation earlier. He, <laughs> he doesn't know that we're all donut experts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so the next uh, topic on our agenda, which was going to be our long topic, but it's now going to be our short topic. Um, we may not get all the way through it, but um, uh, Steve is joining us to give us an overview of um, our road budgets. Um, and just to give this a little bit of context, this came up with the Public Works Commission, but obviously anybody who was at a town meeting knows that our, our paving is of great interest to members of the community as well. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, again, as we're, as we're getting ready for the transportation and mobility study, I thought it would be helpful for us to put in context um, you know, what are we currently spending on our roads program? What money, if any, is available for multimodal improvements? Because we do talk frequently about, oh, well, it would be nice to put a crosswalk here or add a path there. And so what does that actually mean when it comes to the budget? And where would that money have to come from if, if we weren't fortunate enough to get a grant for things? Um, so I'll just turn it over to you, Steve, and you can give us as much information as you can. Um, so, so we're going to look at the clock. I know this we... There's a meeting in here at 11. I promised that we would be out of this room by 1055. And All we right, have so a couple of yeah. of like things at the very end. So if we could wrap this conversation up by 1050 at the very latest. Okay. That would be good. Can get up. Yeah, I will. Um, if I can share the screen, I will bring up uh, basically a, a slide we've used uh, for the Public Works Commission. Um, but again, our, our interest is to the preamble that the engineering division is responsible for developing the capital plans for most of what we see in the right of way. And most people historically, we've talked about roads program and people just immediately go to the condition of the road. And yes, that's a part of it. And that's the one that people are most sensitive to because that's what they're experiencing. But there are peripheral things that are equally important when they come to the right of way. Mm -hmm. And so when Steve came on board a few years ago, started looking at the budget, we said we need to understand the various, you know, areas or bins of investment needs and make sure that it's not just all a wash and gray and people don't understand where we're spending money because you get a lot of disappointment when you have a budget allowance and it may or may not cover all of the interests that you have or needs but everybody assumes their interest is covered. But what happens is you get a lot of disappointment and confusion as far as, well, I thought we were going to, or, and so this allows us to at least manage it. And we are managing the town's system. So we just wanna be clear as far as what we've identified as needs and then where the funds are and then how we're spending it. So that's sort of the, the preamble. So I'm gonna um, okay, share the screen here. So Alan is doing that. Yeah. As a follow up to the previous conversation, um, just want to give an analogy. You're building a new facility, for instance, a, a water treatment facility. You plan it out with the required supplies and maintenance to follow, right? You're going to have chemicals, you have this, that, and the other. A huge part of that planning is how you're going to maintain it. In the future, typically for a lot of other types of public works infrastructure like roads and sidewalks and even add, add in a park, we don't think about that. We don't think about the additional maintenance we need. And therefore, our plowing resources are stretched thinner and thinner, and we don't, we are not able to keep up. And I can see how that can easily happen, how it has happened here. And uh, we need to keep revisiting that to make sure that we have adequate resources to do the maintenance and do it properly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I can only speak for, since I've started here, you know, just over three years ago, um, how things were done before it's, getting that history is not that easy because most of the people have gone, have left. Um, but when we look at what our needs are, we have to think about what our, functions in public works or main functions are. And it's really about keeping up with the maintenance of what we have, keeping, getting our infrastructure in, in good working order as it was meant to be. And, um, and I think there's a misconception that when we get dollars or roads or sidewalks, that we, we're talking about new stuff. 
we can't talk about new stuff until we take care of the stuff that's there. Uh, in my previous job, I remember a, a, a board member saying, I'm not going to approve any new sidewalks until you start keeping up the ones that you have, maintaining the ones that mm -hmm. you have. And that message rang loud and clear because we can't keep adding stuff and not be able to keep up with it. So, so what we did um, without understanding how the program really ran before I came, we started to, like Alan alluded to, separate the different components, more like a program budgeting. Um, people are very interested in the condition of the roads. Um, there are a few people out there who would be okay with living with poor condition roads. They say, well, it's helping traffic coming <laughs> and so on, until it gets to the point where they can't physically drive and there's big craters and that regular maintenance can take care of, of those. So um, a pavement management program is, is pretty much a standard in most communities where you look at the condition of your whole network. We have 108 miles here in town of public roads. Uh, we have about 25 miles public streets, that, uh, some of which we just do plowing. Private. Pri private, sorry. Private. Right. So 108 miles we have been, even before I came along, it's been in a program of pavement management. So you, on a regular basis, in three to five years, you go around, you hire some a company that can do it, look at the condition, and then they enter it into um, a software program. And based on the condition, based on the type of road, whether it's a local residential road or an arterial or a collector, um, those different kinds of functions uh, would give a different weighting in how you determine the the need of the, the road. So between the condition index, which is zero to 100, and those are based on the cracking, the potholes, um, other kinds of defects that you know the trained eyes pick up on. Um, uh, between the condition index and the and the <laughs> function, it, it makes recommendations as to the kind of treatment you, you want to to do. Now, I, are you familiar with the PCI, Pavement Condition Index? Mm -hmm. um, 100 is perfect, it's just done. Zero, it's it's gone. Um, in the first few years, it starts deteriorating slowly. And then it gets to a point, say probably around 75 after five, six years, and it starts dropping quickly. So it goes like that. And then it gets to the point where around 20, well, it can't get any lower than 20, <laughs> but that's when it's really shot. And um, so the, the program tries to keep what's good, good. That's nowadays, going back a few years, and many towns around us have been successfully doing that. They try to preserve that upper limit. So you've got to put some money into that program in, in preservation. and. So last year was the first year we actually tried any kind of real preservation. We've been doing crack sealing, you've seen that for years, but that's just, um, that's more of an annual thing. You can get crack sealing lasting a couple of years, and you go back and you keep, and you keep doing it. The important thing about crack sealing is to keep the water out of the cracks because water getting into the, the base of the road will freeze in the winter time, open up the cracks, and cause more problems. So cracking is an important thing. Um, but last year we tried uh, microsurfacing, asphalt rubber chip sealing, and fog sealing. Um, three conventional uh, pr uh, preservation techniques. Um, they went. It went rather well. We had uh, some complaints upon the nurse Nack Hill. Um, it could be a function of the road was very shady. Uh, the area is shady, and uh, we needed warmer temperatures to really apply this, and we applied it later in the year. Uh, so some of it didn't stick well, and so we had some complaints there. Um, and some other neighbors people, you know, were a little bit upset because uh, they, they weren't used to this. Uh, they, they, they thought, well, this road doesn't need any work, you know, but not understanding that 
that we're trying to keep the road good, right? It, the, the preservation techniques don't cost as much as the uh, typical treatment, typical paving. And um, anyway, so we did some last year with mixed results, but mostly good. And um, this year we're gonna do some more. And uh, so going forward, we hope that the program will have a, the right mix. Now every year wouldn't be the same, 30%, 60 uh, 70 um, ratio it could change based on the needs because you know every year every winter uh, may have a different impact on the road system. Steve, excuse, what's the 70 percent ratio? Uh, well, it'll be like 70 percent of typical treatment like you know milling and overlaying or reclamation. and I, and I say 70 in terms of cost because obviously those rehabilitation techniques are a lot more expensive than preservation. And um, so you're ba you're balancing the the stronger later interventions with some more proactive, less expensive mm -hmm. things that protect capital. Right. So so when you preserve, you may get that that new layer lasts between six to ten years, depending on the type of treatment. And um, when you add a new layer, it brings up that PCI even condition index to a higher level. And then that's saturated again. And then you can try it, you know, so you keep you keep adding. And the whole point about that is that you get more roads on average that are in better condition to drive, mm -hmm. you know? So you a lot of people complain, well, the roads in a bad state, you know, if you if you do a little bit more, you know, you keep more drivable, people are generally happy. And, and, and thinking about people's reaction, you know, we can draw all kinds of data into the program, but condition, but traffic, this and the other. But we cannot put people's reaction in there. And that's something you can't really quantify. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it definitely affects how we operate. But, you, but if you get a, a reassessment of the condition of various roads, you could create a histogram before and histogram later, and hopefully it's going in the, in the right direction or something. Right. Yeah. And um, so we became concerned because in 2018, just before I came on board for the year or so, a condition um, evaluation was done and the report said it was around 78 out of 100. And then we did it in 21 and we're down to like 67, 68, 12% drop of the overall network. And that, that you know, made us very concerned. Um, and so, we knew that we've been getting the same kind of funding year to year. And uh, you, if prices are going up, and you don't increase the funding, you're doing less and less. So between trying to implement the preservation mix with the regular um, paving and, um, and spreading the money out, um, or asking for more money, we think we can get somewhere um, to get a PCI up. Can you give us sort of a breakdown about how much Chapter 90 funding, you know, it, it makes up your budget and how much you ask for from the town yeah. versus how much? Let's you go to, yeah. uh, let's, so Steve was talking so, about sort of preservation, but I'm going right, to. So I was trying to get to how we get that number on the screen. How you get the number. Okay. All right. Got it. So we we have been trying to reevaluate the program as to what this is. And so we we um, brought a consultant on board um, last fall to take a look at what we're doing. Someone with the expertise in the area. They've worked they worked for a lot of towns in this um, you know pavement management. And uh, in the end, they said you need about four million dollars a year to get your payment condition up to an acceptable level, uh, which we will say is around 80. Um, uh, it'd be nice to get 85, but to get to 80, 80 plus, you need four minutes a year. Um, so what we put up there is um, our request. So what line is that? That's right here, payment management appreciated. Right. So you can see, uh, and this is I'm just, I'm just I'm trying to blow it up so you can see. So this was our request. And what we're doing for the first time, well, in the last couple of years, our requests aren't year to year. What we're showing is over a five-year period. 
and that's really important so people can get an understanding of you know what's the it's not just a one time or is it sort of a you know continuum and steve is talking about pavement management you can see shaded below we have 3.8 million 4 million 4.2 it sort of escalates over time and even these numbers are a little bit you know the challenge we have right now is cost of everything are just you know the uncertainty is incredible when it comes to you know supply materials but we were looking at on average four million dollars a year historically we've been in recently we've been investing somewhere in the two to two and a half million dollars a year and, and that would have included the chapter 90. including the chapter 90. Yes. yeah and we have also go ahead and, and how much of the road network does that cover is that the entire thing or is that just a, a percentage of the or so, portion of so it? So what Steve sort of just suggested, we have 117 miles, whatever it is, of, of roadway, and you have to identify kind of what areas you're going to cover. Right. Everything isn't treated in one year. You prioritize. Right. And I like to use the analogy, and I'm kind of going to go there, <laughs> of, of <laughs> your teeth, right? Preventative maintenance goes a long way. It's good to go get it cleaned every so often. It's good to get some treatment on it, some fluoride, whatever it might be. That's preventative. And if you let it go, and if they're new teeth, you have years of, you know, you can eat lots of candy and do all sorts of things. Eventually, over years, it's going to deteriorate. And once it starts deteriorating, it starts going, the, it gets accelerated. Mm -hmm. The cavity gets bigger. If it's not treated, it gets worse. It's more painful, just like a pothole, right? Um, at some point, there's multiple cavities, and you need to go possibly for, you know, a root canal. It's more expensive. It's more painful. The money you spent on the root canal becomes less preventative maintenance on the other teeth. Think of it that way. So it's a whole system that you have to look at. And the preservation is a way of spending money up front to reduce the amount of potholes, the significant structural problems that you're going to start seeing over time. So we've separated it. In the past, you used to talk about the roads program. We have all these needs, inclusive of um, culvert work, inclusive of parking lot rehabilitation, inclusive of um, the sidewalks and pedestrian crosswalks, inclusive of stormwater management, inclusive of tra uh, traffic improvements and signage. We bundled it all together and came up with allowances of somewhere in the, you know, $2.5, $3 million to do everything. And what we've identified, what we're committed to do is tell the community what the real needs are over time. And the reality is, if you look at the roll up of what engineering assessment is, we're at for FY24, $8.7 million. It's about $8 million a year, and it goes up to a million. And, you know, the year is out at 26, 27, um, uh, 28. The town doesn't have that kind of um, these funds, but these are the needs. And so, our job is to explain. If we're going to make requests, and these were the requests that we we made, I'm going to go over to sort of the the roll up, and decisions have to be made, and certain things are kind of have to be prioritized. But this is actually what the proposed, you know, we we submit it to the townhouse and it goes to FinCom. The proposal for our you know needs was for FY24. You'll see everything wasn't funded. I got to reduce the screen a little bit so I can manage this. But what we said is for this this particular um, pavement management, we're looking at two point six million dollars here. But that's just a piece of these other areas as well. When we do work, we also have to consider some of the underground utilities. This is where the stormwater, the culvert, you know, need, need to be addressed. Um, if we're doing preservation, it's likely we're going to be doing anything invasive. But if we're doing a reclamation or a significant mm -hmm. improvement, that's when we start looking at what other infrastructure needs to be done. We don't want to do just the road. We want to make sure we're looking at the stormwater system or the underground utilities and that sort of thing. But it's this is the roadmap that really tells us what the needs are. We've just done a culvert assessment with a third party consultant mm -hmm. to try and capture this. So this isn't just you know engineering sort of 
um, kind of throwing spaghetti on the wall. This is a, a detailed assessment of all of our uh, stormwater culverts. And some of them are pretty significant, some are pretty modest, but we now have a better handle on those. And so, Steve, go ahead. So this is what we did last year for FY24 and, and future years. And, and I, it's not perfect uh, because we don't have all of our information regarding condition of all of our assets. Uh, the culvert program that the next time we do this, you'll see better numbers on the culvert program. But we have to do the same thing for every um, every type of infrastructure we have out there. It's pretty good for the pavement, the pavement management. We need to get some for our sidewalks, you know, the line 19 there, E11, pedestrian safety and bike improvements. You know, those numbers, this is a good guess as to what our needs are, but I think with the, with the transportation study, um, we get better numbers and be able to figure out how to fund fund the, those kinds of improvements. Just so that I, I just want to review to make sure that I'm understanding. So up until this point, you spent you said I, was it two or three or somewhere between there million dollars on the road roads it's program, the road program, which was sure, inclusive of everything. It seemed to capture a lot of things. Right, and that was about two and a half million dollars on an annual basis. Yeah, two and a half to three. Two and a half to three. Yeah. Um, when the Cambridge Turn Park was going on, that kind of interfered with the overall program. Right. And put money aside to take care of that. Got it. Yeah. Um, and so. So this year in FY24, the town, the town budget that we just passed in town meeting, did you get everything you asked for that's highlighted in yellow there? Like what what do what do we actually have for FY24? Let me go to this now. I'm gonna go to this uh because that's what you so but just to, to clarify what we were looking at. Yeah. The the full column that had all of the numbers filled out, that was that's sort of like what you the wish list, not, not even the wish list, but the needs list. Yes. And then you didn't ask for all of that because you didn't, presumably because you were practical and we, knew that you we, wouldn't get it. No, we asked for it. Oh, you asked for it, we, but then we you advised it. it down. We are, this is, this is what's really important. I think uh, it's our underlying message. Mm -hmm. Our job, we don't have any special, you know, all of those assets are really important to the town mm -hmm. and engineering is responsible for managing those. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to, hide anything because it's inconvenient, you know, right. or like doesn't look, our job is just to really present this information. It then goes through a review process, which isn't easy. And I think where TAC is going to be, you know, interested in, well, what about some of these areas of interest? You know, how are they getting managed? Or, you know, how do we ensure they don't get dropped? And if there are dropped, we know why, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you look here, what did it actually turn out to be? This was our um, budget that we received through the town um, um, meeting sort of allowance. So, and I think, so I think the tier one was sort of almost fully funded. I think all of well, it. So this was our request, oh, 1.3. What we received oh my was uh, 285,000 tier one. And some of these things, and I'll just sort of give a little preamble here, the stormwater, where we have significant needs the town is going to evaluate the development of a stormwater utility. And that's something which is more and more common because we are more significantly regulated now on stormwater management. It's no longer an option to just push that aside. It's both on, you know, for climate interests and environmental protection interests. The town has to take this very seriously. So we, we've deferred some costs and we know that. And this is we're capturing it here. Um, but when you look at the the larger capital, so we talk about tier one is sort of from cash, available cash. Tier two is where we're looking at um trying to find the uh um where are we here? Uh don't have that. Okay. Oh, tier two. Okay, this is down here. Th th these areas here are, have been unfunded for next year. This was our ask for um, campus. We talked about our needs on this campus and what we're going to do. We requested 200,000. We didn't receive it. Um, that's been deferred. Pedestrian safety bike improvements. We requested 691. We didn't receive anything for that. And when you say improvements, do you mean like 
That's a good question. Well, yeah. Does it mean, you know, replacing, uh, keeping the sidewalks that we already have in good condition? Excellent point, Steve. Mostly. Mostly. So we do, we've been a little bit more practical about it that if we're there and there's a, some additional work we can do while we're there, we'll take care of it. Um, but we can say, okay, because we're doing this, we're going to do all of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, we are required by law, if we are paving a street, to take care of the handicap ramps, make them compliant. And those are pretty expensive to make. The design is usually very technical. And then construction, because you'll be doing it with, with usually with concrete, you're using the, the, the detectable warning pad and all of that. Mm -hmm. So each one could be three, four thousand dollars. But improving the whole length of a sidewalk means that you have to set the curb, reset the curb to the right level and then replace the sidewalk that's a cost that you normally cannot bear under the pavement management let's give you an example very real world the downtown main street area in this you know area we're doing some improvements in one the intersection of walden and main street mm -hmm. but we also have needs all along monument square probably mm -hmm. to do a ultimately a reclaim to replace that infrastructure mm -hmm. if we do that Everything we touch then triggers requirements through ADA mm -hmm. to make improvements. And what's happening is, well, the pavement may be justified alone in its own silo. The extraneous costs to comply with all the new standards almost frees us out of doing that because they are more expensive than the actual work that we're trying to achieve. And this is the balancing act of standards, ADA, historic areas and you know so we're forever juggling these things so we've actually just done an assessment of the monument square area and we're looking at doing some improvements especially in anticipation of 2025 mm -hmm. and worked with a group where we sort of walked the entire area including the historic you know um, um uh, commission um to observe what is it that we can do and there are some improvements but it just speaks to whenever we do a project, we have to identify what are all the various interests that we need to address. And this is for your group, very important because you do represent sort of, you have to look at all of them as well. And it's, you know, not just the historic aspect, but you know, how does it affect walking, cycling, uh, traffic? And, and when there's opportunities, as he said, and it's a good question. What does an improvement mean? Well, if we're going to touch something, we have to bring it up to standard. Right. That's one. But if we're going to touch something, is there an opportunity to to realize it in context with a larger, you know, connectivity issue? You know, those are some of the things that we need to look at. And if there are, let's flag it. And then we can make the case that this project is going to be inclusive of not just a replace, but improvement. And whether it's modest or more significant, if it's significant, well, what kind of improvement is it? Are there funds from somewhere else that we can possibly sort of parlay in to make this better for the town? These are the things that we, we've we never had this opportunity or, and that's really where I think you folks kind of fit in, where you'll be aware of some of our capital projects. And if we do this transportation study and they start looking at connectivity in areas of opportunity. Hopefully not an if. Well, when? <laughs> it's really it's a when, right? Yeah. Because if, you know, this is an, an interest of the town. Then we have the, the, the understanding and information to start planning. And our, our interest is, and this is where the disconnect has been for town. We've had aspirational plans for decades. Yeah. And they're, and they're, all, and they, they're for a reason. Public works implements real plans, not aspirations. Right, and I think that that's where we see sort of the, the disconnect between Envision Concord, which talks about expanding multimodal, you know, multimodal connections, allowing people to get around without a car, but we don't have a budget to actually make that happen, mm -hmm. and nor do we have specific plans. So that's hopefully right. this will help bridge the gap. Since I'm very cognizant yeah, okay. of the time, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to just to just to summarize. Yeah. What did you end up getting in FY24? Was it just that 240k, yeah, or too. there was also I would assume something for paid paving as well, yeah, which is hopefully more than that. At least uh, two point six five. Two point six five. Yeah. Two point six five. Two point six five. Okay. 
Frank. I want to just say two really quick yeah. things. One is, I think it's really important with re regard to the transportation study that we all figure out how best to inform that and make sure the, uh, the outcomes are useful mm -hmm. because studies can go round and round and mm -hmm. you end up with documents again, right? We all kind of into that. So I'm not sure how to do that. The other key thing I wanted to bring out is, and that maybe we can all learn more about, is this idea of there are right-of-ways in town. There's a network of right-of-ways, and that is where most of the transportation infrastructure and a lot of the utility system infrastructure is, and they 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 go hand-in-hand hand when you do anything major, right? And they're, they're, yeah. they're so, so I don't think the public, you know, they think about potholes. They don't think about what's under there. An engineer yeah. thinks about, well, look at all the stuff under there, including yeah. all the obsolete old stuff and the things that you dig in there and you find surprises and, and and we are so within public works we have water and sewer mm -hmm. and stormwater right. so we have right. the ability to include those things and, and there's and gas to, some places it, and well, and then we have national grid and we have electric and mm -hmm. so we do reach out to them and we try to get them to sort of be aware of our capital plans we don't want to do you know, significant work reclamation and then have them come back and cut a new trench in because that then deteriorates the sort of the, the longevity or value of that improvement. But those things are done. Um, and sometimes with water or sewer, so expensive, we're not going to, we're just going to say, you know what, we're going to wait 20, 25 years. This infrastructure has a once every 75 to 125 year life cycle. Well, roads are, you know, 20 to 30 years is when we're doing major work. So sometimes you just have to forego. But, but they intersect. They do. I think well, they so I'm going to cut us off yeah. here because we yeah. do need to come to a conclusion. I just um, want I to think... say that the final, this, that screen on 24, mm -hmm. you see, that's what we were actually um, provided with funds. So you can see what the ask was. And if there is, for instance, under bridge repairs, you have twenty six, twenty five thousand dollars $25,000, you know, uh, under the... Uh, pavement management, we have 2.65 million. Uh, mm -hmm. For lot rehabilitation, 425,000. That's what we've, that's what we were allocated for FY24. Is yeah. this a document that can be shared with the committee so we can look into it yeah. in more depth? Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I think that this conversation is to be continued because I think I certainly have would like to look, learn more and have more information. So maybe we can find an, a, a subsequent time to follow up. I'll give Carrie. I a have chance. a very quick question. I know you're uh, pressed for time, but so there's obviously limited resources and lots of demands. And um, one of the things I heard you talk about was the turf fields. That's a, a new thing that you're maintaining. When you have new things like that, do you have a revenue source? Like, for example, the turf fields, is that coming out of the regular budget or are the uh, users paying for that? All right, so this is for the, um, when we talk turf fields, a couple of things. We have no money for replacement at this point or even study. So that no, was the also maintenance. The maintenance. maintenance. Uh, I believe the school department pays us for that service. Okay, that's, that's the kind of thing that we need to really buckle down and make sure that they're paying all of the costs back because resources are so limited. And the same exactly. uh, recreation, user fees, all of these things need to be really, really tightened up um, so that the general fund just doesn't have enough money for everything. So thank that's right. you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, just to bring our meeting to conclusion today, um, we have, uh, do we have correspondence that we needed to share with the committee? All right, so we don't have any correspondence today. Um, uh, just to, uh, I'm gonna open it up now for comments from the public, mm -hmm. anybody, or or Terry, if you have um, observer comments beyond that one. Great, great meeting. I love the collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. All right, doesn't appear that we have any questions from our guests. Um, just in terms of our Transportation Advisory Committee meeting schedule, the next scheduled meeting is for June 13th at 7 p.m. But I wanted to float the idea with this group. Do we want to meet, do we want to do this again? Maybe have a shorter meeting just to follow up with this conversation. We also have an outstanding item of finishing our conversation about the site walk 
um, from the library, which we only got halfway through last time. So I'm wondering if it, it might be warranted for us to have an, an additional meeting between now and June 13th. I, I think it's a good idea, but I won't be back until June 1st, just as an FYI. Okay, so perhaps we'd have to have one the first week of June yeah. or the, the the week of the 5th. Would that work for, for you, Mark and Dan? Yeah, so if, if I'm here, there's a possibility I won't be here, but um, if I'm here, it's, I mean, I think you should plan it and then. Yeah, well, I we can um, we can do the scheduling outside of this meeting, but just I wanted to float the idea of having an additional meeting and we'll have to get Nick's availability too. All right, so TBD on when that might be, but let's make sure we have the 13th in our schedules and try to have one the week of June 5th as well. Um, and maybe we can try to do it again during the daytime so you guys we can continue this conversation. Um, uh, all right, so that is it for today. I would entertain a motion to close this meeting. Second. All right, Mark. Uh, yes. 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 Yes.